All right, I still see some few some people coming in, so I'm just going to wait for a sec. Yeah, if anybody is at the back, they might want to make their way to the front. I don't think there's going to be that many people. Um, so it's good if everyone's close. All right, so good afternoon. Hope everyone had lunch and is feeling not too sleepy. Um, yeah, welcome to the first time contribution workshop. And we're here to learn about contributing back to Drupal. One of the first things that we want everybody to have as a tool when they start to contribute is Slack so that we can do all of the communications and find out about all the different things. So first point of call is drupal.org slash Slack. If you have not gone and gotten yourself a Slack account, go ahead and do that. And the channel that most first, con first time contribution would happen in <laughs> is the first contribution. Um, all of these slides will be available, so don't worry too much about taking photos or whatever. I mean, you can, but there's going to be a link, and you can just copy the whole presentation later on. Welcome to the First Time Contribution Workshop. My name is Chris Dark. I speak English and Spanish, so if you have questions in either of those languages, that's fine. Other languages, I'll be using Google Translate or something. <laughs> Um, the link to the slides is bit.ly slash decon24pdx. There's also a QR code there, which should work. Um, myself, I'm a developer. I've been doing Drupal for about 15 years now, and I've been part of the core mentoring committee for five years or so, um, basically running events like this at different Drupal cons. Uh, so yeah, what is the, what's gonna happen during mentored contribution? Tomorrow we have a mentored contribution event and during that time basically what we're gonna be doing is meeting up in groups, finding a table with people to work on issues with and we're gonna be updating the issues talking about you know, what we're going to do to fix the issue, pardon me, deciding what everyone is going to do. So maybe one person is going to do one task, another person is going to do another task. Updating these issues and continuing to contribute afterwards. So today we're going to find out about how to do all of that so that tomorrow we're ready to get going. So this is what we're going to be talking about right now. Why are we contributing? What are the benefits? How can we contribute? There's many different ways of contributing. There's multiple different initiatives for contribution. There's uh, the issue queue, which is one of the core areas for finding contribution needs. Um, merge requests and tooling. So this would describe who the audience right now is. Somebody who's new to the world of Drupal. Somebody who's been around for years and years but has never actually gotten around to doing any contribution. Somebody who's done a load of contribution but is looking for a different way of contributing. Um, somebody who's maybe done a lot of contribution but has seen that there's some changes, there's some new tools, there's some new processes and needs to kind of get up to date with that. Basically, anybody, anybody is welcome at this session and anybody is welcome to contribute. So why should we contribute? So the whole premise of open source is if you depend upon open source, open source depends upon you. It depends upon everybody using these tools to give back and work on them and help build them better. Um, every contribution is valued. 
So we all have like diverse skills in different areas. Something that might seem trivial and meaningless to you might be really difficult for somebody else. Um, different you know, languages, different genders, all these different aspects that make you unique, they all provide different skill sets. Contributing makes you also an integral part of the Drupal community, which helps the, the project move forward. You know, with, if it was just like a couple of people in the room and everybody else is just consuming, uh, we would not be in the situation that we're in right now. Um, one area that um, we don't often talk about as much is why should agencies contribute? Um, so companies that are using Drupal as an open source project, they, they should give back. Um, basically, as in part to uh, you know, give thanks for the tools that they're using, that they're making their living with, but also it also helps them build their team better. So a lot of companies, they'll be like, oh, I, I don't see the point in contributing. And we, we've got the, we use these products, it's cool, we build the websites, but I don't see what the value is in giving, in, you know, doing contrib. Um, there's a huge amount to be learned by doing these contributions. So even if, like, say, for example, you do code or you do documentation and then you turn up to one of these events and you do some contribution and maybe it's a contribution in terms of testing or um, something else that you've never done before, you're learning a new skill. Um, so all of these things are super valuable for, uh, for people, uh, whether it be on their own or as a part of a company team. But also, you know, people love to come to these events. So it's definitely a, a lot of bonuses for why agencies sh should contribute. Um, so one of the first steps in contribution, something that's very hard to do any contribution without, is having a Drupal.org account. So if you go to drupal.org slash user slash register, if you haven't already registered, you can go and set yourself up with an account. Uh, if anybody hasn't done that already, please go ahead and do so. Um, if you're looking at some of the examples I'm making later on, you might be like, oh, oh right, I need to log in. Um, one thing to note is that if you haven't log registered yet, or you've only registered in the last few days, your account might still be sort of frozen. Um, it's just to stop spam bots. So if you do find that you've got a notice on your account that's saying, oh, you know, your account is frozen, um, there's some of us who can unblock you. You can verify that you're a real human being. So reach out to one of us and say, oh, can you verify my account? Um, but yeah, the Drupal.org profile, which is what you'll build up when you log in, um, it contains your username, where you work, you know, profile photo, if you want, uh, social links to different social media, and a list of mentors, for example. So say, for example, I'd say, oh, Matt over there, he's one of my mentors, I'd put him on, and then if people click on me, they see, oh, Matt's a mentor of his, let's go and click on Matt, and, you know, it sort of spreads our network. Um, and also, I'd like to point out that everything that we're talking about today is not code specific. It's not like code is contribution. There's many different ways of contributing. You can contribute without ever touching code. Um, one of the like one of the huge biggest areas that needs contribution is like documentation. For example, there's so much missing documentation that is not code specific. Uh, so yeah, different kinds of contribution. We've got all of this community contribution, so improving documentation, issue triage, which we're going to go into a little bit later on, translations, reviewing content, marketing. Uh, marketing is super important right now. If you saw the uh, key, one of the keynotes, at least, uh, at least the Dries note, we're talking about trying to promote Drupal, right? Um, event organization, which is some of the stuff that, that we do as mentoring coordinators. Um, sharing knowledge and mentoring, which is also something that we do. These are all very important areas of contribution that are not code specific, code related. And then there's other code related contributions. So testing merge requests, uh, testing experimental features. Uh, there's been many experimental features that are now part of core, thanks to all of the testing. Um, there's um, creating merge requests, so 
you know, making a change in code and putting it out there to be deployed. Uh, code reviews and feedback. So a lot of the issues get stuck because nobody actually goes around to doing code review or feedback, and uh, that's very important as well. Um, in terms of documentation, and we can use documentation in two ways. We can contribute back to documentation, but we can also use documentation as part of the work that we're doing. So if we're trying to accomplish a task as part of contribution and we read some documentation about it, we maybe want to go to the documentation site to, to read about that. But then also when we're doing, when we're reading the documentation, we might spot that there's an error and then we might want to edit that documentation. So we're doing kind of like two forms of contribution at once. We have official guides. Official guides are curated, they're, they're governed by, uh, by maintainers, and they are held to a slightly higher standard of editorial process than the community guides. Um, these are the Drupal user guides, the evaluator guide, and the local development guide. And they are, are slightly harder to, to edit. If you want to edit one of those, you have to provide a patch in an ASCII doc and push it into an issue queue. It's a bit convoluted. So these don't get edited as often as the community guides, but it's still possible to do so. That snippet that's there is at the bottom of the, of the curated guides. So if you see that and you click through the links, it'll tell you how to do it. Uh, but it's not as wiki-like as the community guides. That I'll show you in a minute. The community guides is community documentation. It can be freely edited by anybody who's got a Drupal login. Um, so there's the Drupal guide, which is like a catch-up for eight, nine, and later. There's a developer guide, which includes development, uh, sorry, documentation about tools, processes, so on. And the API guide, which covers all of the different APIs. Um, when you go to one of those uh, community documentation areas, you should see when you're logged in that there's a little edit button with a pen on it. And if you click on that, you can edit the page, you can change some text, you put in a reason for your change, and you can submit it. And right away, you'll see the change. Obviously, if you abuse it, you're going to get called out on it, and you'll probably have your account blocked. But if you are making meaningful changes, it is greatly appreciated. Mm. A lot of the documentation, to be honest, for Drupal 7 is still somehow still valid because there hasn't been good Drupal 9 or 10 documentation to replace it. So, I mean, if anybody's gone to look at Form API, for example, you might see some stuff that really needs some work. Uh, there is also um, contribution or contrib documentation which is external documentation pages or internally in the repo of contrib modules. So that's another area where there's documentation that's not on Drupal.org necessarily, but it's still an area where contribution is valuable or where you can find documentation. So there's also the Drupal.org documentation, which covers a lot of things like setting up user accounts, content guidelines, uh, moderation, GitLab integration, all of these guides are also community guides, and you can also update them. Um, and yeah, they'll help you navigate how to use the site and how to use the tools on the site. Another area that's really valuable for um, contribution is the translation site. So that's localized.drupal.org. And on there, if uh, you log in, you go join a team, you can say, you know, oh, I, you know, I speak Spanish. Well, Spanish is pretty much completely translated, but other languages may vary. Um, you can read up the documentation of, you know, somebody will have documented what is needed and, you know, how, what the gaps are. Um, and there'll be basically a list of text snippets, basically, which you can go in and translate. So you can translate a piece of text, or you can review somebody else's translation. Um, you can also moderate translators, um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of work to be done on on the language side of things. Another form of contribution 
is uh, the Drupal Association. So having a Drupal Association membership is a financial contribution, but that's also a form of contributing back. And uh, like events like this wouldn't happen without the DA. Uh, there's another area which is marketing. I mentioned before that's the Promote Drupal um, initiative. And uh, if you go there, you can find out about ways to promote Drupal in local events or in many different areas. Um, getting the word out about, hey, Drupal isn't this clunky old thing that you saw five, you know, 10 years ago, it's now pretty slick. It's pretty important. Um, a lot of people move away to WordPress or whatever, and so promoting it is important. Also, as you know, part of that is the idea of Drupal ambassadors. So promoting Drupal and sharing articles, you know, tweeting about things or uh, writing on a LinkedIn article or whatever, uh, even like talking on podcasts about Drupal, uh, all of this stuff, all this stewards and brings in more people into the community who can also contribute. So yeah, super important. Um, again, some of the other areas of Promote Drupal is working on presentations. My presentations, I mean, we try our best, but you saw what Dries Note looks like, right? It's really slick. Like, if we had some people who are good with graphics who could do this kind of stuff for us, um, yeah, like social media, photography, like going, just, yeah, going around taking photos during these events. Um, logos, logos was a big one. We recently, with Promote Drupal, had this effort where we were trying to make a logo for every single module. Um, it's a lot of work. Another marketing area is we have these different roles. Uh, so we've got like project leads for marketing, writers, videographers, all of these things. Oh, the Drupal recording initiative, I'll go into that in a sec. Um, so yeah, if you happen to have skills in uh, edit video editing, for example, we have mentor, uh, sorry, we have contribution videos, which I'll mention right at the end of the session. And those take me forever to do because I'm not good at video editing. And it takes a lot of work. But somebody who maybe does it every day, they might be like, oh yeah, I can do that, no problem. Uh, the Drupal recording initiative is something that has been going on for many years. And there's basically a little box in pretty much all the sessions where there's like a, a but red button and you press it and it records and then it uploads everything later on so people can watch all of these sessions um, on the offline, sorry, online later on. And um, there's basically getting people set up with all these things, it takes a lot of work. So if you can actually uh, become part of the Drupal recording initiative, uh, you'll get trained on how to use the tools and the hardware and if you go to like camps in your local, in your country, you can be the one who turns up with the box and plugs it in and then gets everything uploaded. So, the issue queue. Uh, the issue queue is one of the biggest areas where we track uh, contribution efforts. Some of it is code, some of it is not code. Um, but it's basically a task list. Think of it like a Jira or something like that. Um, and it's the place where we put in all of the, pretty much all of the work that we need to do. Even stuff that's outside of um, like Drupal.org. Say for example, we've got like some marketing efforts or something, we might make an issue in the issue queue for it, even though if it's something that is just to track the, the effort. Uh, we are going to go into the issue queue in a second, but we are really going to focus on core, not contrib. So there's two different sides to the contribution, um, core and contrib, and I'll go into what those are. So the stuff that's on Drupal.org um, is, it contains both core and contrib, right? So core is the, the part of Drupal which is the Drupal itself, right? The, the basic fundamentals of, of Drupal. And then contrib is all of the additional contributed modules and themes and things like that that get added on. You wouldn't be able to do very much without the contrib modules, 
but um, for the purposes of the mental contribution, we'll be looking at the core stuff, not any of the contrib stuff. It's a bit too much to work on otherwise. Um, so in terms of what we're looking to work on for these contribution events, uh, we normally suggest when you're looking at using the issue queue to start small, right? So finding an issue to report, uh, updating an issue, maybe just changing the state from, you know, um, needs work to uh, review, uh, triaging issues, uh, which means basically going through and checking if an issue is still relevant, so on. Creating merge requests, that's a bit more, you know, where you're actually making a change and requesting that to be pushed up. Providing feedback on other people's changes and testing other people's changes. The issue queue itself for core can be found at drupal.org slash project slash issues slash Drupal. So this is the list of issues for Drupal core. If you go into a contrib module within Drupal, you'll find it also has its own issue queue, but this is the issue queue for core. And if you go to bit.ly slash Drupal dash novice, you should find a t uh, filtered list, which is issues that have been tagged novice. So the novice tag is basically a way that we tag issues that we think are somewhat you know, accessible for first-time con contributors, rather than something that has been stuck in limbo for eight years and needs you know, maybe $10,000 of work from a company to get out the door. Um, we don't want people who've never contributed before you know, getting way deep into something and not being able to understand what's going on. So the novice tags are a good place to start. Uh, that doesn't mean that every single issue that's tagged as novice is still a good starting point, which is why we do issue triage, and I'll go into that in, in a minute. Some things that used to be marked as novice maybe have become a bit more complicated. But yeah, um, the issue queue itself, you'll see um, up close that it's got title, it's got status, priority, category. So the status, normally, you know, if it says needs work, it needs work. If it needs, needs review, it needs, you know, you need to go in and actually review the changes that have been made. Um, active, you know, that there isn't actually any, potentially any work done on it yet. There'll be um, a version, so ideally, I mean, this screenshot's from a while ago, so it shows 9.3, but you'd be looking at stuff that's uh, 10 or 11. Um, it's got number of replies and last updated. Those are pretty important. If something has 5,000 replies and was last updated two years ago, that might not be a great candidate for something to work on. Um, if it's got one reply and was updated yesterday, that's probably a good one. There's an advanced search filter. So if you click on advanced search, you should be able to extend out some more um, filters. And so if you go there, you can see you can actually filter by the component, by the status, by the category. So say, for example, you're looking for items that are within the AJAX system because you're a JavaScript developer. Uh, you can go and filter down to that, or you can find stuff that's documentation, um, any sort of feature. You can also, if you're looking to find an existing issue that you've already identified, and you want to check and see whether or not it exists, this is how you would do it as well. Say you found a problem with uh, the menu system where you know, some menu is not visible at a certain point, you could just you know, search for you know, menu uh, not showing and then filter it by bug report or something like that and then see if somebody's made a report for that. So yeah, as I said before, um, some issues you want to want to look at, some maybe not. Um, in the case of contrib, projects that are not maintained, in the case of core, that's not really relevant, but in the case of contrib, it is. 
Um, if there's a lot of issues that are marked as like won't fix, that's, yeah, normally because it's just not in the, it's not planned to, to fix those. Uh, issues that are not current, so again, if it's a really old issue, maybe it's not a good candidate. Issues with over 20 comments, yeah. Uh, if it's got tons of comments on it, there's maybe a lot of churn. That's not necessarily the case that you shouldn't work on something with more than 20 comments, but if you see one that's got two and the one that's got 50, it's, it's a higher chance that the one with two comments may be uh, a bit easier to, to process. Um, something that's been changed a lot, so if it's gone from you know, needs review to needs work to needs review to needs work, it's probably because there's some, maybe something isn't right in the requirements. Uh, and also, something that's critical is probably going to be a bit harder to deal with than something that's a minor. So, merge requests. Um, for those of you who have ever dealt with patches, hands up if you've dealt with patches. Okay. Hands, of, hands up those of you who've dealt with merge requests. Okay, cool. There's a sort of even number there. Uh, yeah, so we used to deal with patches on any of the changes that were actually affecting the code base. Um, and as of November 2020, we switched to merge requests. Uh, for anybody who isn't clear what a merge request is, basically we take a fork of the Drupal project, we create a branch on that fork, we make a change in that branch, and then we make a merge request to pull that change back into the Drupal project. Um, oh, and there is a video about that, and amongst all of the videos, there's a video about merge requests. So, the anatomy of an issue. An issue should have a lot of different metadata, which is pretty important. You've got a title, obviously. The title, sometimes we see an issue that's got a really confusing title, like they've put too much information into the title, and it's almost hard to comprehend. Uh, sometimes it's only got two words, and again, it's like, I have no idea what's going on in this issue. So the title is very important to have it right. Uh, there's the category, so you know, that'll define if it's a bug report or a feature request, um, so on. There's a priority, which we've seen before, um, and the status, which tells you what state the issue is in. There's a version, which will tell you which is the dev version of the project it's in. So, uh, yeah, if you're looking to work on something that's, you know, recent version and you see an issue that's 7x, there is still some in there. Probably just leave those alone. Um, the components, so there's different components that you can work on. Um, all of these things just help you narrow down to something that you've, you can find something that you might be interested in. There's tags, which we saw, like the novice tag. Um, and then assigned. So for any of the core issues, please don't assign any issues to yourself. The only people who would assign an issue to themselves is like a core maintainer. Within contrib modules, you can assign them, you know, an issue to yourself if you're working on it, but within core, they should never be assigned to anybody. Uh, we'll go into how you can kind of take uh, ownership of the, of the issue for a few, you know, for a short period of time but it's not by using the assigned. Um, and then you have a summary, which should contain um, like the, what the problem is, the motivation, what is the, solu the proposed solution, the next steps, and so on. And there's various different templates for the summary. One of the important things that we have is the metadata, so like needs documentation. Um, maybe we find an issue that looks great and it's got a valuable piece of code change in there, but it's not clear or, you know, it needs some, some doc, doc, for example, you might want to add a tag needs documentation. And then somebody who's looking for documentation work, they could scan through the issues and find an issue that's tagged needs documentation. And they go, ah, I'm good at documentation. Um, as I said before, there's uh, templates for the issue summaries. And so we'll be looking to see something along the lines of that. There's, you have a problem or motivation. You've got the steps to reproduce. 
And the steps to reproduce, they would normally be very specific steps, like, uh, you know, go to here, click on this, load this, install this, so that people who are maybe not used to doing contribution, especially for these novice issues, don't get stuck trying to replicate the issue, that it's very clear how to replicate it, right? Like, we all know if we do this at work, um, if we spend ages, like, spinning wheels trying to find how to replicate a bug, that's not good. Um, the proposed resolution. So if you've, if somebody's created an issue and they've actually, they know how to do it, they just don't have the time or, you know, they know what needs to be done, they can put a proposed resolution in there. Um, you've got the remaining tasks. So the remaining tasks should always be kept up to date. One of the things that happens in a lot of issues is that you'll see uh, nothing in the proposed, in the remaining tasks, and you'll see 50 comments, and you have to kind of read through all the comments to figure out what is left to do. So updating the remaining tasks and saying, okay, um, I've done everything, but I haven't done, I haven't created the tests. So, okay, create tests, run testing, you know, uh, get this RTBC. Um, RTBC, by the way, means reviewed and tested by the community. You'll see that acronym floating around. Um, that's quite an important one for getting these things released. Uh, UI and API changes, so if you're making a change that affects the UI or the API, it needs to be mentioned there because there could be some accessibility issues or whatever that need to be tracked. Uh, data model changes, the same, if there's any change to a data model. Probably for most of the novice issues, there won't be, but anything like that would be in the summary template. So, there's these different templates, and you can choose like a bare one, a documentation template, visual issues. They would have slightly different prompts and slightly different titles. So if you're creating an issue and you know it's a visual issue, you could choose that one, and then it will fill in like the titles for you to, to, to complete. And that one's kind of handy to prompt you to make sure that you've put in the information that's required. So for the summary, you should be able to understand the issue and the current status of the, of the issue, right? It shouldn't, have, it shouldn't be a lot of work to figure out what's going on. So short, clear sentences, um, markup if possible for the, any code snippets that you put in there or CSS or whatever. Um, identify the key points, you know, bullet lists and things like that. Links to comments that people have made on other issues, uh, UI and API changes, um, they can be left as TBD, if you, you know, haven't determined anything yet. Um, so, yeah, issue queue transparency. Basically, one of the things that we want to be aware of is that there's a lot of people working on these things, possibly at the same time, possibly with different skill sets, right? Not everybody is like familiar with all of the right things to do and even people who should know better sometimes make mistakes, right? We all do. So if you see an issue and you see something wrong, you know, be kind, don't be like, everybody's kind here to be honest, but yeah, we wanna be kind. Um, and follow the issues so that you can actually keep track of what is happening on the issue so if you are writing on an issue, or you just see an issue that you're actually interested in, you can click on the star and follow it. Um, and then if you see that people are writing comments about it, you know, you can write back and be like, oh yeah, maybe I disagree with that. Let's you know, have a conversation about what the right response should be for that issue. Um, but yes, in terms of transparency, um, be transparent about what it is th that you're doing, that if it's your first time, talk about that, so within the issue, you can put in the comment like, hey, my name is Chris Dark, I'm working on this issue during DrupalCon 2024, I've never worked on an issue before. Um, talk about why you're using specific tags, so say you tag an issue with uh, needs documentation, say why does it need documentation? If the issue is being held for, non for new contributors, we do create a comment for that. So you might actually see some of the issues during mental contribution which have a little green tag on them that says, this is reserved for DrupalCon. Please don't touch it, at least for today. Um, because sometimes we mark things as novice and a company somewhere just 
goes through and works all, fixes all the novice issues um, before we even get to them. Um, so who is working on the issue? If you're working on the issue with somebody else, mention them, get them to put a comment in as well. And if it's a reason for you to assign the issue to yourself in, in uh, contrib, mention why you're assigning it to yourself. Hey, if you're trying to assign an issue to yourself in core, mention why. Somebody will probably come along and ask you, please no, do that, but at least mention why you're doing it. So issue queue etiquette. So report issues in the, cor in the correct project or place, right? So try to not fill the wrong area with issues unrelated or you, know, you see a problem and you think it's in paragraphs and you go and post it into core um, because it's probably a paragraphs problem. There's actually an issue reporting section in the community page which talks about this and you can go through from the links later on and read that. Um, try and solve the issue yourself before you create an issue report. So if you know that, if you know how to solve it or if you can spend five, five, 10 minutes and try to fix it, you can do that beforehand. Then you can still create the issue and put in the proposed solution because you figured it out. But at least you're not creating the issue and then having somebody else try and figure it out while you already know what it is. Um, read and reread the relevant documentation, right? Because it might be that you missed something um, and you miss the bit where it says, oh, if you are using this with an external link, you need to put this tag in or whatever. Um, download the latest development version as well because most of these issues, we're gonna be reporting them to the latest dev version. So say you are testing something and you say, oh, I see a, you know, I'm getting a PHP error and uh, that seems wrong. I see it in the report log. Um, and you go and create the issue, uh, and it turns out that it, somebody already fixed it in the latest dev, right? You're just making a bit more noise. So if you go and actually download the latest dev, and you test it on there, and you can still replicate it on the latest dev, then yep, good to go. Um, and try to get help from the community. So resources support on drupal.org, you can find other support options. So uh, not to say don't do that, with uh, a, a creating an issue, but if it's a problem where you don't, you can't figure out how to solve something and somebody else can help you to solve it and it's not actually something that requires an issue, then it, again, it removes that, um, that extra issue that's not needed. So uh, yeah, when you do have an issue and you go, okay, I wanna create an issue in the issue queue, first search the issue queue for similar problems. Sometimes it might not have the same title that you would imagine. It might look like it's in a different area, but it might have like the same error because it's all related to the same thing. Um, if you do decide that you are creating the issue, provide a full description of the problem as possible. So as many links as possible, as many screenshots as you can that make sense. And um, if you did fix it, if you figured out, ah, I finally found a problem, please go back and actually report that in the issue. Even if you don't create a patch or whatever, go back and report it in the issue because then somebody else can go and create the patch based on your findings. So another area of etiquette is uh, tagging. If you just add tags into a comment, into an issue, it will create new tags for you. If you go blah, 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 blah in the tag, it will create a tag called blah, 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 blah. So if you're trying to tag something with needs documentation, let it autocomplete when you type needs documentation, because if you type needs document and then you submit, it might ta create a new tag. So try to find the autocompleted tags when you're, creating it, when you're tagging an issue. Um, there's also guidelines for when to assign an issue to yourself, and there's a link there in the slide. You'd be able to click to that when you um, access these slides. Um, and yeah, just remember if you are not a novice, you don't consider yourself a first time contributor or a novice d contributor, try to leave those novice issues for, for them. Um, another area of issue queue, 
etiquette is uh, don't report security issues in the regular Drupal issue queue. Because if you report, I found a back door into, <laughs> into Drupal and somebody sees that, they could use it for nefarious purposes, right? So there's actually a, a security issue reporting procedure. So don't hijack other issues. Posting your question somewhere, you know, considering it be more logical to, you know, create a new issue. So just jumping into somebody else's issue and saying, oh, what about this and what about that? You know, if it's not, you know, part of the same problem or the same issue, create a separate issue. Don't mark a, an issue as reviewed and tested by the community. So this RTBC, I mentioned it before, uh, when an issue has already been resolved and it just needed testing and people will test it, they'll review it, test it, and if it is good to go, they'll mark it as RTBC. Um, and if you mark something as RTBC and you haven't tested it before to check and see that it actually works, and one of the core maintainers goes, oh, it's been RTBC'd, uh, I guess it's good to go. Um, maybe when they go and check it, it's going to waste their time if it turns out that you didn't even bother to test it and you just marked it for some reason. So be aware, RTBC, you know, you need to test it. And um, yeah, the, one of the other ones is there'll be markdown files in some places like readme's. If there's a readme.txt, don't just rename it to readme.md. Uh, because it'll need other formatting changes. So it's one of those things where people sometimes they'll upload a README um, and they don't get around to doing that. Another issue, uh, another thing to avoid is changing the statuses from fixed to close fixed. Um, basically, close fixed is different to fixed. Um, so fixed is automatically closed as fixed and removed from the list of open issues after 14 days. Uh, so yeah, leave it as fixed. Now, don't open a merge request or upload a patch on a fixed or closed issue as well, because that is, you know, if it's already fixed, just it's gonna create more noise and stuff if you're creating new merge requests on that. Also, don't create a merge request without adding any code. Uh, wait until you've got some code to create a merge request. Otherwise, somebody else will go in and say, oh, there's a merge request, and they'll try and test it, and there's nothing in there. Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of use of AI nowadays. We're seeing use of chat GPT to create code and things like that, and Copilot and all those things. And it can be very powerful. It can be very useful. And you might be like, oh, I'd rather use, hey, chat GPT, how do I write a piece of JavaScript to you know, make this pop up? and it'll produce something, and you go, ah, oh, that seems to work, I'll paste that in. Um, if you are gonna do something like that, it might work, great, but clarify in um, your comments that you've used AI to generate that piece of code, review and test it carefully, actually re read what it's doing, because the AI's, uh, you know, the language models will often hallucinate, and it might pull in some code from Stack Overflow that does who knows what. Um, use some human intervention to actually correct things, right? Don't just copy paste blindly. And if we see that there's like bulk use of AI in you know, putting in code into issues, um, it, you might get banned. So as long as you're clear about what you're doing and you say, oh, I use Copilot to help me with this, that's great. Um, in terms of the tools that we will be using, there's various different tools, and they can all be found on drupal.org slash tools. What we will be using tomorrow, primarily, is Drupal Pod. So Drupal Pod is based upon Git Pod, which is basically like a cloud development instance. Um, there's also local development environments, so you can use DDEV or Lando or Doxal or something like that. So if you have your own development environment already and you're happy to use it, that's great. Uh, we use Tugboat for testing, for previews, and simply, simply test.me also for testing and for testing patches, uh, spinning up versions of, the, of Drupal just to try something out. So what's Drupal uh, DrupalPod? Um, Basically, yeah, it allows you to run Xcode or 
um, sorry, VS Code or PHP Storm uh, with Xdebug, uh, live previews, all of this stuff on the browser. You could even do it on your iPad. Um, so you download an extension on Chrome or Firefox that allows you to, that spins up these instances. And then you would go to any page on an, of a, an issue, so a core issue or module or something like that. And then you go to the Drupal pod extension and you would choose a patch or a fork and it would spin up this development environment for you. Um, sorry, I need to switch to a short video. Let me see how I do this. How do I switch to my video? I might need to, sorry, I need to make this exit out. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to work. For some reason it's not moving across. Sorry about this, I'm having trouble with moving things between screens. Um, if only the visual AV guy was here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah, we would go to drupalpod.com. That takes us to the GitHub project. And there you could click on the download. I've already got it downloaded on mine. And then it'll give you a little extension. So then we're going, in this case, it's just a example issue that's like a playground. It doesn't have any, anything really in there, but we've got a fake issue fork and a merge request in there. So the tool would allow you to choose the, the issue fork. And we choose Drupal 11 in this case, which is what it is. We choose the standard profile. Um, and then we log in with GitLab or GitHub. And the first time we do it, it's going to prompt us to actually authorize Gitpod with our account, with our Drupal.org account. And then there's a few other options. You can choose different editors and things. Um, but the defaults are fine. And then it will basically spin up this cloud development environment. And I will be running this video through a bit fast because it takes a few minutes sometimes. So you'll see there in the command line, it's receiving objects. It's basically running ddev behind the scenes. So in a minute, I'm going to be doing a jump cut towards the end so that you're not staring at the screen forever. Um, but yeah, it downloads all of the different ddev tools. I should have done the jump cut before. There we go. So it says it took 77 seconds. It felt a lot longer than that, but there we go. So we have a live preview on the right. And that live preview, we can share it with other people. We can send them the URL. We've got all of the code in there. In this case, there's actually, it's not, there's no actual module code, so it's empty, but um, it's got the core in there. Um, and there's instructions in that editor bit, the contributor guide, where you can just follow through the instructions. We can also share the workspace, so we can actually share the editing experience with somebody else. So say you want to do code, um, like shared development, you can do that. I think that's the end of the video. Now I just need to get back to the, how do I get back to the other one? Oh yeah, there we go. Right, I seem to have, hang on. Uh, I think I've lost my um, developer notes. Sorry, my <laughs> slide notes. Okay, yeah, so, pardon me, I've, I can't seem to switch slides anymore. Sorry, this is still, 
way too complicated. Okay. Oh, yeah, I need to turn on the captions again, sorry. Okay, so as you saw, we used a uh, fork merge request in that Drupal product example. Um, forking a merge request is another process that we'd be going into, and there's videos about this. Um, but basically, we created a fork of the project. We create a branch on that fork. Some of that stuff is also suggested when you create a new fork. It creates the new branch. It does it kind of for you. You make changes. You make a commit on those changes. And then you can open the merge request. And uh, if everything passes, if everything tests correctly, the branch in fork is merged into the project. Um, strategic initiatives. One of the areas that we do need a lot of contribution with is strategic initiatives. Uh, Project Browser is going to be there tomorrow. They've got a lot of work to be done. Um, I don't know if you've seen Project Browser being mentioned, but there's a lot of work to do for that, and they'll have a couple of tables. There's other strategic initiatives, of course. Uh, easy out of the box. Um, various other ones. I've kind of forgotten now. <laughs> I don't have my notes in front of me anymore. Um, and then there's community initiatives as well. So community, in community initiatives, if you go there, you'll see a list of different community initiatives, um, including promote and things like that. So uh, if you go to that link, you can read off about different areas to contribute in the initiatives. So all of the videos that we've, all of the topics that we've talked about here are uh, actually in videos on YouTube. So if you go to bit.ly slash Drupal dash contribute, you should be able to see a playlist of all the videos. Now, bear in mind, I made these videos during COVID. So things might have changed a little bit. Some of the versions might be out of date. Um, the Drupal pod video is slightly out of date. Hey, if you do video editing, let me know. Um, the video playlist includes issue forking, documentation, all of these things. Um, and then there's a list of links on these slides which you can access from the, when you load them. Uh, so how to search on the queue, how to extend Drupal, issue tags. These are links to different areas of documentation. So if you access the slides from the QR code, you should be able to go and click on these links. So yeah, thank you very much. Here's the link to the slides. Great if you could see you guys tomorrow. Everybody at 10.30, I believe, is when we start Mentor Contribution. And if you want to see this presentation again, we'll be running it twice tomorrow. So I need to drink a lot of water. Thank you. Any questions? I wouldn't say exactly the same, kind of on the same idea. Yeah. Yeah, I try to be the same, but I'll forget things and I'll say new things. Yes. Sorry, um, just so in case nobody heard him, he's asking, is this the same presentation as tomorrow? Yes, if you've gone to come to this one, you don't need to do the one tomorrow. You can go straight to mentor contribution. And there'll be people at the, um, the start of the contribution day, there'll be people guiding you. So if you turn up and they say, have you already done the first time contribution workshop? They'll guide you to the mentor contribution space where you can find a table. If you want to watch it again, feel free to attend. Uh, but otherwise, see you at mentor contribution tomorrow. Uh, any other questions? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, how many people need to have reviewed the thing to mark it as RTBC? So, yeah, I mean, uh, basically, if you've marked, if you've reviewed it, you could say, I've reviewed and tested this. Um, if nobody else has actually looked at it, maybe you just say, I've reviewed it and tested it and it looks good. If you're the second person, maybe you could like mark the state status change. That's a very good question. Somebody else? Mentor contribution remotely, yes. So we have the Slack channel where we have uh, first, contribute, uh, first contribution channel for contributors. And people can log in remotely and 
work on an issue along with people who are there physically in the room. When you are working on an issue together with people in the room and remotely, once it's decided what's going to be worked on, you'll post the issue in the Slack channel, and then there'll be a thread for, every, for each of those issues where people can share thoughts and write comments about what's, what's happening. And also, the issue itself will be updated. So Drupal.org slash Slack is where you get onto the Drupal Slack, and the channel is called first-contribution. First Thank you. So if you know the solution and you're working on it, is that what you said, sorry? All right. So yes, if you know, if you're, or if tomorrow during the mentor contribution, you would be working on the issue, so you would be updating the issue with your name, and with everybody working together on the issue is gonna update the issue with their name. So I would write, my name is Chris Dark, I'm working on this, on this issue during DrupalCon 2024. I'm available to work on it for the rest of the day. Maybe I'm working on it with Matt, and Matt is also going to put a comment and say, I'm working on this during DrupalCon 2024. I can work on it till the end of the weekend, because he's got nothing else to do. So, so then anybody else coming in and looking at those issues afterwards, if they see on Saturday that comment, they'd be like, OK, somebody's still working on it. If they see it on Monday, maybe they'll be like, oh, hey, no one's working on this anymore. But by putting your comment in and saying you're working on it and you're saying what your expectations are about how long you're going to work on it for, that should provide anybody else looking at that issue with knowledge of, you know, who is, who's, if there's someone currently working on it. Again, also, when you're working on these issues, you would keep them updated. So you'd say, we have, you know, worked on this, we found a solution, we're currently creating a patch, blah, 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 or merge request. Yep. Rules or guidance on squashing commits or anything in the merge requests. Um, so this, the, there's a documentation page about merge requests, and if there's anything in there, it, it would be in there. Um, normally, if you most merge requests aren't hugely like iterative, but sorry, if you've got an answer on that, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, the Drupal.org workflow is at the end of the process of a merge request or a patch, the commits are going to be squashed anyway. So right. how you get there in the merge request uh, is up, up to us as a group um, as we're working on the issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh-huh. So if you are working on the issue, yeah, uh, just put, I'm working on this issue. Yes. So if you know the solution to the issue and you are working on it and you, you know already the, the solution, if you were the one who created the issue, you might already want to prepare the solution before you've even created the issue. So then you create the issue, and then you immediately create the merge request. If you were the one, if you didn't create the issue, and you see the issue, and you go, oh, I know the answer to that, you could just put a comment in straight away and say, I know this solution to this issue. I'm working on this right now, today. I'm going to push up a uh, merge request. The reason we don't want to assign it to anybody is because then it's like you're taking ownership of an issue that if you for some reason can't work on it, something happens, it's locked down to you. Sorry? Oh, sorry, we're running out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. And again, questions tomorrow. We can do this again. You can ask us questions or you can reach us outside.
So, is everyone excited to contribute to the Drupal project? All right. So, again, first steps, Drupal.org user account, join Drupal Slack, install Drupal Pod browser extension, and you'll be ready for tomorrow or any day at a contribution event. Thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone.